When Guinzi Sitcha Nai, Shi JC Firth Hagen, Dinji Ju Kucha Kuch In, and Uvik Ethli, Edmonton Katan Guich In, Itchia, Didu Sarah McLeod Firth, Jiji, John Firth, Jiju Margaret Hagen, Jiji Cliff Hagen, Shahan Sylvia Firth, Shiti Willard Hagen, Masik Gwadat Chukchur Adrin, Haish Idri Shonihli, Masi. Good morning, my friends. My name is JC Firth Hagen, and I am Dinji Ju Kuchia Kuchin from Anuvik Northwest Territories, currently living in Edmonton, Alberta, in Canada. And I just traditionally introduce myself in the Guchin language, where I share who I am, where I'm from, who my parents and grandparents are. And I am the creator of the social media initiative Guchin Language Revival Campaign, hashtag Speak Guchin to Me, which I created in 2015 to raise awareness towards my endangered language, Guchin, um, out of less than 5,000 Guchin, there are less than 300 speakers around there, standing at 5% of my nation that still speaks the language, mostly over the age of 65. And I'm very happy to be here today. My heart is happy. Thank you, Creator, for this day. It's my first time in the States, and I'm from the Arctic, so it's my first time ever being in this kind of climate and place. Very excited. And I wanted to first discuss like who I am, what is Guchin, where am I from? And so, and share my journey from how I began my journey to fluency at the age of 14, to being 25 years old now and still working towards the language. I'm a second language speaker. Um, my parents don't speak the language, but my grandparents could either understand the language or speak it. And when I was growing up, I got a lot of questions asked towards me as to why I want to learn my language, um, being told things like, my language is dying, it's dead, there's no point in learning it. And but I really just always thought about my family, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my nation, my ancestors, and we survived since time immemorial on the land. My peoples are caribou peoples. We followed the caribou and surviving in such a harsh land in the Arctic. There's my community and then there's the Arctic Ocean, but we're not directly on the Arctic Ocean just to kind of get an idea of how far on earth I am. And um, Learning my language and speaking my language is really just an ode to my family, my ancestors, and my peoples. And um, I was, I'm very fortunate to have grown up traditional, being taught who I was at a young age as a Guchin woman, as indigenous. I was able to grow up in my own community, of Inuvik. Um, I spent more than half of my life frequently going out on the land, stay, staying at my dad's bush camp, approximately like 15 minutes away from Inuvik by bush plane, and totally being isolated on the land, um, like participating in things like dog mushing, um, boating. I'm very fortunate to have also grown up around elders and language speakers, and my parents always fostered like who I am as Guchin, as a Guchin family, being exposed to on the land activities. Um, growing up really close with my family, I was always at my grandmother's 
surrounded by aunties and uncles and cousins. And at a young age, um, growing up so strongly in, my, in culture and identity, I always wondered if I'm in, why do I speak English? And then I asked this to my father, and he actually started explaining to me at a very young age, um, like the effects of colonization, Indian residential schools, the effect that it's had on my family, community, nation, and peoples. And then I vowed to myself that I was gonna become fluent in my language one day. And it's something that I've always strived towards. I've been very fortunate, as I keep saying, because I'm so happy and grateful. And um, <clears throat> that I was able to attend in language classes from the beginning of school, from like grade one, all the way until grade 12. And since I took an interest in language at a young age, I've always been really fostered by my community, elders, first language speakers. So um, oftentimes I'd be hanging out with an elder, with my parents and their friends. And then members of my community would actually, and still do, like come up to me and start speaking the language to me and sharing just something that's so special, and that they actually gift me which in language resources. Um, and I'm very lucky to also have a lot of resources that I'll get in touch with later. Just as a little example, um, I was at a hide camp a couple weeks ago, actually, outside of Inuvik, and um, it's really cool, I was like watching the fire. I helped participate in a youth camp to get youth out on the land, expose them to their language, um, teach them cultural teaching, such as moose hide tanning. And um, I was watching the fire, and my dad's friend that was a camp helper started like speaking the language to me and teaching me little things like out of the blue. Just so amazing, Idri so neatly, my heart is happy. So, which in language class for like 20 to 30 minutes a day um, was always like my happy time. I was always a shy child. Um, like I wasn't interested in sports, which is like mostly the thing to do in small communities. My home community of Anubik is a little over 3,000 peoples and it's also a fly-in and drive-in community, but it can feel very isolated. And for my slideshow, I apologize if I might look unor unorganized, but I had so much that I wanted to share, so portraying that in my slide. And um, so, I continued with my language. I didn't really, reach out to my elders initially in like elementary school, but I took pride and joy in learning the things that we learned in, in language class, such as animals, the weather, um, basic little commands like Anai, come here, our colors, and then more in high school, the language started to advance a little bit more. And so when I got to high school, like I really didn't like school at all. I was like, why am I even here? <laughs> um, and so I took solace in, which, in language classes. They made me happy at a time when I felt like not much else really did. And I would, um, when I was around 14 years old, I realized if I wanted to become fluent, I still wasn't there. Although I'd been going to in language classes since I was like in grade one or so, and um, uh, I, we weren't like initially learning like conversational in. As I said, the language like slowly advanced. We started learning more phrases and um, more descriptive 
words such as like how to say skidoo and one thing I always remember is like how to describe a skidoo or like a car is the word itsy and it something like middle so I thought that was really cool and um, so we had which in language dictionaries in our classes indigenous books along with like which in books and the language and portraying where we're from, our communities, and um, really cool books like Sarah Simon's Jeju book, which actually portrays like a large which in family trees in the Northwest Territories, also known as Denende, or in the Delta where we're from. And I also like to mention Jeju Sarah Simon, who was my uh, Jeju Margaret's favorite auntie who lived to be well over 100 years old and she helped translate the Guchin language into the church, Bible materials, and was like a walking encyclopedia for like family trees, for languages, and she's still fondly remember remembered today. And so I began my journey of fluency. So I would look through the little Guchin dictionaries and I would actually like pick and pull words that I liked. That like, legoshu, of course, pig, little insults and um, just little things like that I wanted to learn, like yikai is aurora or um, Daunaji, kind of what is your name? And I'd write like a little list of words that I wanted to learn. And um, so every day of the week that I was in language classes, I would actually stay back after language class and speak with my Go'onatan language teacher, Annie Jane Charlie, which is such a big, influence in helping foster my journey and um, she would sit with me and go over the words that I picked out to learn and um, help me pronounce them and I would actually write down like how to write down the pronunciation like guinzi is the word for good so I just put like guin dash z and that's how I memorize the words. And then every week I would work on memorizing my list of which in language words to learn. And the next week I would come back with a new list. And um, by this time I was kind of known as like the girl that's learning her language. And people even in high school and around the community would come up to me like a little high school girl and ask me to teach them the language, which was really cool, but a little weird and overwhelming to me. Of course, being a teenager, but like, how am I supposed to teach you the language, you know? <laughs> and, um, but I, of course, like on social media, back then it was like Bebo, and then slowly translated into Facebook. I would actually always share my love for my language and culture. And it's really cool on the Facebook memories. Going back to like nine years ago, 10 years ago, I was sharing the language on social media. So it's really like a natural fit that I would go on to um, start a social media campaign. So I graduated high school at 17, and then actually moved away from my community to the capital city of Yellowknife and the NWT. Just like growing up in isolation, and of course, we all know that there's like lateral violence, and just being a young girl, I wanted to explore the world, telling myself I'll never go back to my home community. And, um, so I got to Yellowknife and I upgraded my schooling because also in our school system um, you usually have to upgrade before you can even get accepted into a college or a university. So I was like a big city girl in Yellowknife of 20,000 people but I still wanted to learn my language 
And um, so uh, I didn't have anyone to directly speak with anymore. My parents don't speak the language. I'm actually really shy as well. Um, so I was sti I'm still too shy to pick up the phone and call someone and ask them questions and go over to someone's house and learn the language with them. But when I went back home to Inuvik, and if I seen a Guchin speaking elder on the streets at the store, I would stop them and share that I'm interested in learning my language. And if um, I was able to, I would actually ask them also words, how do you say that, how do you say this? And I've never been declined by an elder or speaker. Um, if I ask them how to say something or to help me with the language. So I'm very fortunate there. And um, I, I would actually, I actually even went into the Guchin Tribal Council, our band, we're not self-governing yet. And they actually just like gave me a whole Guchin dictionary for my own use when I described that I want to become fluent. So along with this is when my own like self-learning journey began when I was 17 and the l wanting to learn the language is always so strong with me. We also have language programs on the radio, so I would even turn into the radio and listen. And um, since like, I guess it's learning the basics and learning with a teacher. I can always pick out what they're saying on the radio, even though I can't directly understand it. And so I can, and like mostly they're just talking about like animals, hunting, trapping, the weather. And um, so I would expose myself to the language that way. There was actually like, um, Facebook posts in the language. We already had a Guchin language group from our relatives in Alaska, which in are from Alaska, going through the Yukon and Northwest Territories. And so this, so I went on in my life, upgraded, started working, and just being a young adult. And then when I was around, 20 years old, I realized I was becoming disconnected from my community and from who I am as a Gucci woman, although I always held who I am very close, but I realized I wasn't going out on the land anymore. Um, I wasn't participating in our dances anymore. And like, I was just becoming further away from being a community member, so the Guchin Tribal Council actually had a call for Guchin youth applications to go out on the land and um, be with elders and learn about the language and the culture. So I applied and I was wrote a long essay about my how proud I am to be Guchin and everything that I learned growing up. And I was chosen, and after this, Guchin like kind of started to mentor me, and um, I was able to participate in our assemblies, which is something that I was never interested in growing up, and um, actually spoke at one. I always thought it was so cool seeing our leaders and our chiefs, and my father, who was a chief when I was born, like travel around in their beautiful hide beaded vests and go and advocate for us. And uh, I was kind of saying myself in that position, but I never thought I'd ever do it or even be able to be where I am today. So I was really mentored and fostered and worked towards being in the position that I am today as a recognized advocate and leader in my nation and being able to travel to the United States and Europe and around the North and Canada, representing Guchin and sharing my journey. And so I, um, around this time, I was kind of like also a little stuck. 
I was working, but I wasn't going to school, and I'd gotten into partying, so I was just kind of stagnant. And so, like, growing up in a small community and, like, having low self-esteem and not really even thinking I'd ever even graduate high school or ever even leave my community, I didn't think I could ever really be anything. Although, growing up, I was always encouraged to stay in school, get my education, and um, out of the blue, actually, I was asked to be a youth radio host. So I did that, and I was able to um, interview and be exposed and honor and showcase the amazing work being done with our youth in the Northwest Territories across Canada and beyond. And since I was given like such an amazing platform and gift to like really show me that I was someone, um, I knew that it was something that I couldn't just let go after two or so years after the radio show ended. And I was really thinking, how do I give back to the people that have mentored me and that have helped me through all of these amazing things that I've been able to see and do in my life. And that went back to the very beginning. And then I remembered my vow to myself as a young girl and my passion to learn my language. And then I started really playing around with the idea in my head. And I actually researched language revitalization in high school. And um, I followed the work published by like National Geographic and um, showcased, looked at websites that showed language revitalization in like Asia, Australia, and um, the Guchin, uh, Guchin Tribal Council actually even posted um, an application and call out for people to go to Ottawa, Ontario, and participate in a um, Arctic Council language conference. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm not a teacher, I'm not fluent in my language, but I'm gonna apply anyway. Never really traveled that far, or even by myself at this time. I was still around 20, 21, and so I applied in my application. I just noted that I've always wanted to learn my language and I try to, and I was accepted. So I was sent to Ottawa and I was exposed to the circumpolar Arctic countries, Canada, United States, Finland, Greenland, um, Russia, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, my apologies if I'm missing one. And although, unfortunately, Russia was not able to participate, um, I, there was youth from all around the circumpolar Arctic that were learning their language in, in language revitalization. There was Sami youth from Satmi that started up their own language school because there was only a few members of their language left. Um, so many youth doing so many incredible things in their community. And um, there I was exposed to hashtag speak Sami to me. And um, it's an initiative created by the Sami Youth Council in Satmi, Northern Europe. And it is like a joke. They, um, just to kind of garner interest, like speak Sami to me, what is that? Uh, like, and they also have th things like flirt with me and Sammy. So it's kind of related to that, like all these really fun language initiatives. And um, that's where they um, post their language on social media, you know, like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and they take a photo, like I could take a photo of this beautiful ceiling and um, they would caption it in their language, in the language of the country, and in English 
For example, it could be in Sami, in Norwegian, and in English. And they would caption the photo, like, I, as an example in my language, sun, star. And then I'd post how to write sun in Kuchin, the translation in English, star, and include the hashtag, speak Sami to me. And they showed how to do this, how they do this in their presentation. And this was just exactly what I needed. Um, I was like, so after the presenter was done, I actually came up to him and I was like, I love hashtag speak Sammy to me. Would I be able to copy your idea? And I was like, this is an amazing way for me to work with my language and work in language. And he was all for it. He actually stood with me and showed me the apps to download. There's a lot of free apps out there, such as PixArt, and showed me how he creates these pictures, such as the one that I made. And so the fire was lit. Uh, not too long after, I created the Kuchin language revival campaign, hashtag speak Kuchin to me, in the spirit of hashtag Sammy to me. And since then, there's been hashtag speak Cho to me by Itua Scott Enns, who is also at the same conference. And it's inspired many more movements, and there's actually a whole array of hashtag speak my language to me. So it's really amazing. And once again, just loving and learning and sharing my in language story and passion has led me to where I am today. Um, there's, in 2015, I created the campaign, conveniently, it's now on the slide. And um, it's been really amazing because I can kind of like, kind of felt like, I guess, growing up and sometimes not feeling like I had many people to talk to in the language or that could help me. Although my grandmother's fluent, she's almost 90 years old, and Guchin is her first language. And she's a Guchin language translator. She's been one of the key members in translating our language into dictionaries and the ones that modernize the language, just translating cell phone, iPad. <clears throat> BBM code, Blackberry, and she's my biggest inspiration. She's really my everything. I'd sit down with her and after school when I was visiting and ask her how to say this and that in the language and she'd just point at things like chew water, so yellow, and um, like in just in a few seconds, although she may not speak the language all the time, um, she can just translate and speak the language like nothing. And it's funny, um, she's Kuchia Kuchin, which I am matrilineally, and I'm also Taitlit Kuchin patrilineally on my mom's side and my dad's side. And I grew up speaking Taitlit. And when my grandma speaks the language to me, she has to, repeat herself like seven times because our language like is so different than English and it's like a spitty throaty language and I had braces at the time so there'd be like a whole lot of like like trying to speak and <laughs> people had to laugh at that when I was in language classes which I also participated in after school and um, so I predominantly speak Taitlit Kuchin, and it's really too bad. There's not a whole lot of Kuchia speakers and resources. And um, I also speak a lot of other dialects, as we say. Um, our language vary, variants um, for where we are. As an example, a family could be at one end of the lake 
and another family could be on the other, and they could speak the language differently. A little bit of similarities, and we call that dialects, which can be really um, difficult at times because once again, like I'm also told I'm not speaking the language correctly, only speak Taitlit Guchin, but it's like I learn from elders. I've been in Guchin language classes for like half my life, and I'm from so many different uh, Guchin bands because my family moved all over. Ancestrally, we came from Alaska, moved to Yukon and around the Northwest Territories, and so. And then during my the creation of hashtag speak which into me, it really garnered momentum within our youth and our nation. As I was getting into before, there is more of a course on emphasis on signing land claims, building economy, getting jobs than there was for the language and the youth. Although our First language speakers have worked hard and fought tirelessly for decades to carry on our language. And I always think about my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my great-grandparents, um, Mary and Simon Modest were one of the last families to move, to stay in the bush and not move into communities. And just to think how much change has happened, how much change they've seen, how much change our people have seen, and to go from, like, on my dad's side, I'm kind of the first generation to not live in the bush. On my mom's side, I'm the second generation um, not to live in the bush. And so I really think of them and it was really cool when hashtag speak which enemy started, like to see all these amazing in language revitalization initiatives come up around the Northwest Territories and around Canada. Hashtag speak which enemy has been called like one of the first in the NWT, but like I don't really think that. There's always been momentums and initiatives such as mine. I just happened to come in at a time a few years before the International Years of Indigenous Languages. And hashtag speak in to me had in youth from all over the in nation, across borders, speaking in the language on Facebook, sharing the language, and comparing dialects with each other, which is very special. It's used as a teaching resource. I'm frequently um, reached out to by like teachers, members, youth, linguists, PhD candidates, and even a teacher in Old Crow, Yukon, a small Wichita community, reached out to me on Facebook saying she tried to catch me on the, at the airport when I was passing through to go to Inuvik or Whitehorse. I sneakily posted on Facebook to see what would happen. So she tried to catch me at the airport to give me a sticker because she teaches about like safe and positive ways to use social media. And um, using hashtag speak which into me as an example. And since 2015, the campaign was created. There's been more like laws being passed on language in the Northwest Territories, more of a dialogue and presence even spoken by our leaders and politics. But um, one struggle is really keeping the momentum. It's been, well, since 2015, I guess, four-ish years now, and then I'm still doing this work. And I actually took a hiatus for a little while. I've always done the work. I've been able to travel extensively, um, be with my own people, our relatives across the north, Canada, and now here. And 
Um, as highlighted in my slideshow, my uh, community actually fundraised for money to make hashtag Sikuch enemy t-shirts to support the work that I'm doing. And um, I'm able to give presentations to our youth. And yes, my motivation, I really, like, my family, my ancestors, my community, how I've been, my language learning has really been harnessed as to what I'm doing. And I'm so grateful to be really cherished where I come from and to be able to do this work. I took a hiatus for a while due to like grief, sudden losses in my life. Uh, big changes. I went back to school and naively I was thinking, yeah, I can do speak with in school at the same time, but it's actually really hard. And, but I also am very privileged to be able to still do this language work and attend school. I graduated college this year and I'm pursuing my third year university right now. And I mentioned my ancestors and how we're known as caribou people. And we also say that half our heart is a caribou. Um, the caribou couldn't survive without us and we couldn't survive without the caribou. Very deeply entwined with our culture. And Garter my thoughts here. It's my grandmother and my sisters, and of course, I'm wearing the Svikuch Indemi shirt. Um, one am really amazing thing that I'm so happy to be able to be a part of and growing up and seeing that my language was endangered and that it's kind of like a half and half perception of my language, like it's either like apathetic or it's really important and people are wanting to learn. One like my nephew just turned two and a while ago I was in Anuvik with my sisters, my mom, my grandma, my uncle, and my grandma would speak which in to my little nephew and my mom would also speak which in to him too. And then being told my whole life that my language is gonna die within my lifetime, my language is dying out, and then being able to see the like, intergenerational love and passing on of our language is so special to me. And everything that my family has gone through, like my Jeju Margaret Hagen would want to learn the language and try to speak it, but which in was also thought to be old fashioned. You don't speak it, you speak English. And she'd also be teased, called like hook in day, fish eyes, because she had blue eyes and she came from a Metis family, part which in, part Scottish from the influence of the Hudson's Bay Company, traders of the fur trade that came onto our territory. And my grandfather, who went, was also an Indian residential school survivor that never talked about it. And I've been told he either spoke the language or could understand it. And this is my to do, Sarah. And just, how she's really held on to our language. And although she didn't pass it on to her children, my mom said that she asked her, why did you teach your 12 children how to speak the Guchin language? And she responded, I didn't think it'd be important. I didn't think it'd be the way it is now. And things that I'm saying now have also been echoed throughout this conference. 
And uh, so I've mentioned my motivators being my ancestors, my family, and they're also our elders. I'm very privileged to be, have like elders in every Guchin community in the Northwest Territories, even Yukon and parts of Alaska, like Fort Yukon, Fairbanks, that are all there for me if I want to learn the language. I have elders that have reached out to me saying like, I want to help you. My Jeju Mabel English is in her 80s and she called me the other week after my culture camp and told me how proud she is of me and how she just got her in language certificate from the University of Victoria, BC. And she was told that she wasn't like a real instructor or like language teacher because she didn't have the credentials. And now she does. And she wants to be involved in the secondary language speakers and youth leaders coming up and help them and mentor them. And this is another photo of our on the land camp outside of Inuvik. I went a little bit of an hour hike and the beautiful delta where I come from. And how our community has always been there for me, motivated me. Um, like I can be walking around in so many different communities. And I'm fortunate to travel and see a good in and like um, I'm able to do things like this and People even start like crying, being so happy that to see someone doing this work and to be so encouraged to always be able to go home to Inuvik, although I haven't been there, haven't lived there for over eight years, still haven't been back since after high school. And Yes, um, just now, like, I was in Fort McPherson, Tate Jay, where my Jeju is from. I spent time out on the land, outside of the community, doing another youth camp. So I'm really able to live my, like, dream of being able to do language work, culture, working with youth and community, and being able to expose our youth to the language and go back out on the land. And one um, challenge I mentioned, motivation. And then I realized when I'm out on the land and with youth, um, I notice like it's hard when we have language camps outside of the community because then people are wanna go, going to want to go into the community and how <laughs> people say that they miss internet and showers and wanting to make more space for language. Every two years we have a Guchin gathering and um, we meet in a Guchin community. Um, a few years ago, I believe the, yeah, the meeting was in Fort Yukon, Alaska. And I was kind of asked or being spoken about, about, to, about being a coordinator. And I was thinking, okay, how do I implement language into spaces for peoples to learn? Um, and I was thinking maybe we can have like one hour a day where it's nothing but the language. And we'll have so many youth and elders and young children there that can be exposed and ask questions and bridge the gap between youth and elders in that way. And now we've had so many incredible opportunities for our language than we had when I was growing up. Like I had the radio language classes with elders and um, now there's like a paid uh, ma master apprentice program for learning the language. There's a pilot program coming out um, which in language immersion for preschools. And 
I'm very happy to be here today to learn from everyone and hear what's happening in other communities and what's working, kind of what's not working, and just sharing how our youth are our future and how, like, I never would have thought that my work would, like, my family would be interested in the language and the culture. And then how I've had so much support. There's in language tattoos. And then I'm always on the news across the country in the north about what I'm doing. How my parents, family, community, and elders have helped me. And now we have other language resources such as interactive dictionaries. You can just go on a website and click with your finger, with your mouse, like which in word, and it'll read it back to you. And uh, we don't have like anything like super advanced yet, like Rosetta Stone, but there's so many ways to learn now. Like I'm so looking forward to December when I have a month off school and I can really just immerse myself. The University of Fairbanks, I believe, has a in language university program for free where they teach how to talk in the language. And then I just have so many amazing resources such as these CDs and it's free door people such as apps for learning the language and even how to sing. And I mentioned how I was on a hiatus and I experienced lateral violence and being in school and away from my community can be discouraging. But I always have support behind me, beside me. This is a quote from an elder. I heard a friend say, we only lost our language one day at a time. We can learn it back one day at a time. Stay strong in the path, my brothers and sisters. And what I would do, what I would do differently is I never really reached out for help. I've had so many people be inspired and create their own learning resources, but they also get discouraged and trying to manage everything at once. Um, sometimes I have language resources created for me and trying to uphold the language community while only being one person can be a struggle. So I'm really working on reaching out on what I'm going through. And since I was able to go out on the land in my own nation about since being separated for so long, I told an elder of my story and my struggle, and she said, just do it. And I was like, yeah, after a few years of being discouraged, I'm gonna finally just do it. So I've been sharing more language words on social media. I know about over 10 sentences from my own brain, which is really cool. I included a little bit of a vision to play with, to expand what I'm doing with funding and to how to make learning the language, traveling, going on the land, just being indigenous a reality for me. And so I'm 25 years old now, turning 26, and I've really been learning the language since I was 14, trying to be fluent, and I've been told by elders it may take a whole lifetime for me to become fluent in the language and just you be patient. And what's being told here is like we're trying our best. And there, here's some words for thank you in the Northwest Territories of our, I believe, nine indigenous languages out of 11 official languages. And so I hope you're all able to get a little bit of who I am, who Guchin are, where I come from, hashtag speak my language revitalization journey, and where I've been able to come and go just by learning my language, and masicho hi.